most of you have heard from me, so I'm not going to spend much time talking, but I wanted to offer a few comments and some uh, quotes from uh, some papers that I have appreciated their perspective to kind of set the 35,000 foot uh, view on this. Uh, the, the Center for Sustaining Ag and, Ag and Natural Resources defines sustainable agriculture as an ag production and distribution system that achieves the integration of natural biological cycles and controls that protects and renews soil fertility and the natural resource base, that optimizes the management and use of on-farm resources, that reduces the use of non-renewable resources and purchased production inputs, that provides an adequate and dependable farm income, that promotes opportunity in family farming and farm communities, and minimizes adverse impacts on health, safety, wildlife, water quality, and the environment. These are good goals, and I think one of the more articulate attempts at defining what we mean by sustainable. Uh, sustainability is a word that's become so overused that it's almost lost its meaning for most people. Uh, so I like the idea, and it, but it does beg some definition. Uh, there's a, <coughs> a geographer at UC Berkeley, at least I think he's still there, named Nathan Sayre, who's kind of a, uh, an odd, uh, or a, what's the word, an unexpected comer to the range, public range battles in the Southwest in particular, and he's been a significant voice in those debates. Uh, but there was an essay that he wrote for a conference I was at about 10 years ago. So I'm going to read some of that. He says, sustainability in an abstract sense is hopelessly vague. Taken alone, it can be only defined tautologically or circularly. That which is sustainable persists while that which is unsustainable does not. <laughs> the longer something has been around, presumably the more sustainable it must be. This, but this not only lacks content, it also limits us to viewing sustainability retrospectively when the point usually is to try to anticipate or plan for the future. Something that has persisted may nonetheless vanish in the future. So what are we trying to sustain and over what time periods? What are the processes that sustain it and how do those processes interact? I believe that Western ranching is both more sustainable than is often assumed and yet highly vulnerable to current trends and forces. The threats it faces are more social than ecological and the tools for sustaining ranching must therefore be primarily social in nature. Ranching has outlasted beaver trapping and bison hunting Beaver, beaver and bison looked like cases where an activity was ecologically unsustainable, but in truth, it wasn't the activities per se that were unsustainable, but the way they were practiced in the 19th century. Uh, he quotes within this article Jim Corbett, who was one of the founders of a collaborative natural resources group, kind of like a CRM in the Southwest called the Malpai Borderlands Group, uh, who pointed out that, quote, ranching is now the only livelihood that is based on human adaptation with wild biotic communities, end quote. From an ecological perspective, this is still Sayre speaking, range livestock production is probably the most sustainable part of the nation's beef industry and more sustainable than most of our agriculture." End quote. Jerry Holacek, a longtime range scientist from New Mexico State University and a, a sometimes colorful commentator on range issues, has argued that it, it doesn't take much imagination to see rangeland-based livestock production as a national security issue. While this might be a stretch for some people's thinking. Uh, he points out that all other forms of food production depend heavily on, on petroleum, and that rangeland-based livestock production does not, or at least doesn't have to. And this has been one of the things that, that uh, got me into rangeland ecology and livestock production and keeps me motivated. Most people have to find you know, some, some reason why they get up in the morning and go do what they do. Uh, but my thinking is that if, if we as a culture can produce food and fiber in a way that maintains naturally occurring plant communities and all of the associated ecological goods and services that are attached to it, uh, you know, net primary productivity, uh, resilience of those ecosystems, habitat value, water purification capacity, and maintain open space, why would we, why would we not do that? And maybe we even have some duty to pursue that vigorously. It also seems to me there's some decent common ground to stand on here, and most of the time when people get on the ground and talk about actual plants and soils and uh, riparian systems, there, there is some common ground 
in where things ought to go. So we're, we're here to discuss one significant aspect of ranching sustainability, which is clean water. And I think it's important to get this right, partly because it, it requires getting a lot of other fundamentals right. It's kind of like the, the, the keystone predator, so to speak. You know, getting this right has economic value to the individual uh, because diverse functional ecosystems produce more forage for more of the year and resist in invasive plants. Uh, but it also has nearly incalculable value to society. And a lot of economists have attempted to, you know, quantify these ecological goods and services in a way that, in monetary terms, but, but all those come out with estimates or calculations that are very, very high. Uh, Holacek points out in the, the published article I mentioned on national security that between 1994 and 2004, 10 to 22 acre parcels accounted for 55% of the growth in housing areas across the country. And his point was that most of this is land that is effectively taken out of agriculture, even though it's, uh, you know, sort of a, a ranchette. Uh, that fragmentation doesn't usually reverse. So uh, I think we, some of us anyway, who are tasked with being the go-betweens uh, to educate both ranchers and continue this academic dialogue that, that needs to inform the regulatory processes, have some responsibility uh, to acknowledge the, well, the benefits of well-managed grazing and also be willing to point out and work with producers on the ground to fix the negative consequences, sometimes highly significant negative consequences of poorly managed livestock grazing so that we uh, produce positive environmental consequences. Uh, that, in general, is the subject for the seminar today. workable. Um, the uh, list that I have here, and I wanted to go through two or three of them, well actually a dozen of them, um, were kind of interesting. Back in 1970, one of the earlier, there were some things before that, but one that I wanted to mention was a guy named uh, Deutsch that uh, discovered what maybe we all understood intuitively at least, was that there are a number of diseases that can be transmitted through uh, various kinds of waterborne pathogens and that may have their origins to livestock, uh, particularly salmonellus and leptospirosis. And they'd done some research in Iowa at a swimming hole where some kids and dogs and even hogs had uh, been affected accordingly because of some uh, contamination that had come in there. And so the idea that there is a risk is, is real and it was identified fairly early. Uh, Deutsch was working uh, on some information that a guy named Wilrich a few years earlier had come up with when he had discovered a similar thing associated with kids swimming holes. Uh, then back in the, uh, a few years later, uh, a guy named Gildrich, 1972, uh, began to notice uh, something about frequent pathogens that were coming from uh, livestock and wildlife, uh, which began to support these concerns for public safety. Uh, Kinkle, in 1970, uh, discovered that related bacteria density seemed to have something to do with livestock movements. And uh, he was working in Colorado and discovered that when the animals would come down to the stream for a drink and then back up to wherever they were foraging, uh, that they were getting swings in bacteria levels that he associated with the proximity of the livestock. Uh, Morrison and Fair, following up on that, had a series of papers from 1966 through 1968 uh, where they found similar responses to what Kunkel came up with. Um, and they began to look at grazed watersheds versus ungrazed watersheds. Well, somebody like Julie that's got a range management background knows that grazed versus ungrazed back in the 60s and 70s meant 
no grazing versus abusive grazing. And so there's a wide variety of what grazing means. But we were getting some kind of a, a ballpark figure here, perhaps at least. And uh, they also discovered that these uh, effects waxed and waned fairly quickly and that uh, something like an hour or two hours of exposure to sunlight changed the pattern very quickly. And so the bacteria uh, had a, it's an interesting thing, they have a long life and they have a short life, all said in the same breath. And how can this be? Well, Ken will explain that to you a little bit later, but uh, there's huge numbers, but frequently they are sequestered. And so that's the short life piece. And sunlight makes a huge difference, especially for the stuff on the surface of the cow pat. Um, and so it gives us some management tools. As we begin to understand this, we have some management tools to work with. Um, Slauson and Everett in the early 70s were dealing with the um, the uh, Colorado River system. Now, you all know enough about the Colorado River system to know that it's a big system with lots of tributaries. And they found that the uh, bacteria numbers were pretty constant in the Colorado at pretty much all times. But when they went up into the tributaries, they discovered that there was a lot of variation. And so they began to uh, uh, see a sense of, hey, we go up to you know, the source of where these things are coming. So that was interesting. Um, and then a fellow named Mac in 1974 came up with what was a novel idea for land managers, and that was these bacteria are capable of multiplying in the environment, you know, outside of the gut of the warm-blooded animal, which uh, the definition of Escherichia coli, E. coli, is that it lives in the gut of a warm-blooded animal. And um, that was interesting that this could happen. And the uh, circumstances, of course, are pretty specific you know, what, what temperatures and nutrient levels and so forth. But it is possible, and he demonstrated that. Uh, now, Hendricks and Morrison, several years later, said, yeah, you know, and not only is it possible in cold water, but it um, is probably in balance with the stream's self-purification ability. And so we have a push-pull going here, and that's interesting. See, at every step we're learning something, and learning some tools, and learning what the realities are, and what the opportunities are. And so I think if we're going to be effective, we have to know both, what the reality is and what the opportunity is. Walter and Botman in 1967 came up with a study that really made most of the people who were working on a paradigm perhaps a paradigm that didn't have any knowledge or research behind it, but a cherished belief. This one was fascinating. I think I'll go to the whiteboard and draw you a picture. Now, you have to recognize that I grew up in Nevada, and we didn't have much culture, but we did have a PTA that saw to it that we had art contests. And second and third grade, Hey, I'm the guy that won the art thing. So when I draw the pictures, you'll recognize that I haven't improved much since then. But uh, we'll, we'll draw the pictures, and we'll see what we got. OK, here's this interesting, fascinating thought process. Let's see if we can see how Walter and Botman ultimately worked it out. They had a city of Bozeman, Montana right there. And the city water supply for Bozeman, not unlike the city water supply of Salt Lake City or the Dalles, Oregon, and many other places around the west, had a watershed above it that, uh, with its tributaries, drained down, and that's what the city tapped for its municipal water supply. In Bozeman, they actually had two of them. Cool. And the city of Bozeman had some money. Good thing. They were pretty sure that they could control their water quality if they'd put a fence around these things and keep activities out of them. And so they did that. But they had some money. They didn't have very much money. 
and so they could only fence one watershed. All of a sudden, this is making scientists happy. We got, we got a control. Can you imagine that? Okay, so we're going to put a fence around this one. See? Now you know why I won third grade art contest. Um, you also know why it kind of stayed where it was. It's third grade art. Um, and then they started sampling them. And it just drove them nuts. Because what happened is they consistently picked up higher bacteria numbers here and on the other side. So they knew they had made a mistake. So they sampled and sampled and sampled, and it came out the same way every time. This was a paradigm pinch that uh, really was difficult for these people to get their heads around. So they went beyond just fecal coliforms or Escherichia coli. They did some seriological analysis where that was before DNA, but they were able to, with a series of serological techniques, to determine, uh, very expensively, but determine what the origin of these bacteria were. And what they discovered is they had created a refuge here. And every deer and elk in the country jumped the fence and hung out there because when they put the fence around it, they closed that watershed. And this watershed, which they didn't, couldn't afford the fence for, we're going to do that later, of course. But, uh, they had, still had recreation, they still had picnickers, they still had activities of various sorts in there. Well, what were some of the experiences elsewhere? Red Butte Canyon out of Salt Lake City. Um, this is the canyon, the mouth of that canyon is where Fort Douglas is. And for those of you who know a little bit of Western history, you know that when the Mormon uh, community was established there, there were some difficulties that they developed with the United States government. and the army was dispatched to keep the lid on things. And they built a, an army fort at Fort Douglas, which is right where the University of Utah campus is today. And uh, so that's where they established their headquarters. And they claimed Red Butte Canyon as their water source. And they put a fence around this thing. You know, they controlled it. Nobody's allowed access on Red Butte Canyon. Uh, Red Butte Canyon was, is a fascinating place because they maintained that closed watershed status since then. That was in the 1840s. So we've got some experience here with at least a, a case study on, on Red Butte Canyon. I was really fortunate as a graduate student in Utah, Utah State, uh, to be one of the few people that was allowed in there as I was doing some water sampling and working with a young wildlife biologist, another grad student, who was uh, given a permit to collect specimens from the various wildlife uh, that were in the area. And what uh, we discovered was that there were, of course, bacteria in Red Butte Canyon, and they tended to concentrate at the beaver dams, at the ponds behind the beaver dams. And as we began to look at it and we'd see what the patterns were, the beaver dams became the attractants for wild creatures that were coming in, including waterfowl that were migratory and would come in and spend the night there and then move on the next day. Uh, when um, my colleague did his, uh, his sampling and would allowed, he was allowed one species, one individual of each species, Scientifically, that makes it tough, doesn't it? What's the definition for how we do uh, statistics? We have to have n minus 1. Well, if n is 1, n minus 1 is 0. So, you know, I guess if you were going to be a purist on this thing, he didn't have much of a study. But it was an interesting set of observations. And what he discovered is what we all know now, is that every one of these species produced Escherichia coli. Every one of them. With one exception, he didn't get any bacteria in the beaver he sampled. And then I just said the beaver dam seems to be the place. I am sure he screwed up somehow, that he had his incubator set wrong or something, and he just didn't get that sample to show, because surely the beaver, as a warm-blooded animal, has them just like everybody else does. 
So that's probably an artifact. But it is kind of fun and a little bit ironic. And so here we are. Now we're suddenly recognizing that there's a myriad of sources that are coming in here. That this bacteria is coming from a lot of places. Now again, good information. Because we have to know what we're working with before we have a fighting chance of how do we handle it. And so from there, it moved on to some additional studies that I'll share with you. Um, we have the Bozeman experience here. And uh, then, uh, again, about the time I was finishing up my graduate work at Logan, we had uh, a series of researchers there, a guy by the name of Colthorpe and Darling. Colthorpe was the major professor. Darling was the graduate student. But Darling and Colthorpe were working in uh, Logan Canyon. Some of you are familiar with Logan Canyon. And uh, it goes right up to the Idaho border. And so they were looking at some places up there. They had three watersheds to look at. And so they did. And um, they had one of them that was uh, what they called their natural watershed that had wildlife in it. They had another one that had the wildlife, but it was also grazed by sheep. And then they had a third one, which was water, wildlife, and grazed by cattle. They didn't have the sheep and cattle commingled or sheep or cattle or wildlife. So those were the three things. Now the way I sometimes play this when I tell this story is I get four people to come up here and help me. And one person has to be the graph, the x and the y uh, axis. And somebody else has to be the um, wildlife only. And somebody else has to be wildlife plus sheep. You know, we do that, but you know, that's a little uh, hokey. So what I'm going to do is draw a third grade picture up here for you. And so it goes something like this. <laughs> y-axis, or x-axis, y-axis, this is going to be uh, numbers of bacteria that time across here. And uh, what they discovered over the course of the summer in the wildlife only uh, site is they had the bacteria, and um, it waxed and waned some. I mean, it's not a static line, but it, it uh, fluctuated with some numbers kind of like that. And then they trotted to the watershed, or simultaneously at the watershed adjacent to this, where they had wildlife plus sheep. And that's how it turned out. So they had a little higher numbers. Again, fluctuations, some ups and downs, but, but something like that. And I thought I had a green pen. Oh, yes, here it is. Um, and then the third group were the cattle. Wildlife plus cattle. And that's where it fell in. OK, really interesting. And kind of fits the paradigm that most people would think, I guess, that uh, the uh, numbers would be elevated if you had sheep or cattle in the in the system. It was fascinating to some people on why were the sheep different from the cattle? Why did watershed two and b differ from watershed three there? And so there was some uh, some managerial looks at that. And well, what would you guess? Why did the cattle and sheep come out differently? Higher amount of what? True, but they had five sheep for every cow. So probably that, on any given individual, yes. But as a group, I think it was about even. What do you think? Sheep grazing tends to be more nomadic in cattle than Western states, especially Utah and Nevada. And? And what? Cattle hang out by the river. Yeah, you're both right. Okay, uh, one is they're more nomadic, in other words, they're, they're moving in and out. And they're moving in and out because they have a herder and a, and a uh, border collie dog that are telling them where to go. The cattle tended to be, open the gate, put them in, and we'll come back and get you at fair time. And uh, what was happening is the cattle in this case were managed in such a way that they went what they wanted to, and what they wanted to do was go hang out at the bottom of the stream. Well, we've seen that repeatedly. It's not surprising. Okay. In the case of the sheep, they 
turned and looked at the herder who motioned to the motor collie and said, okay, now we're going up on the hill. And they came down to get a drink of water, but then they were put back up on the upland, some distance away from the water. And so that seems to be the reason. Okay, pretty good clue all of a sudden. Management makes a difference. So moving those animals around made a difference. Uh, there was a reduction in, in the kind of numbers we're seeing. Well, then the next question is that anybody who looks at that cool drawing that I made would say, well, swell, but what's the risk? You know, are we at high risk or low risk or what? This is an imprecise thing, and Ken will speak to it some when it's his turn. But uh, the question of what do you measure and what does it mean? And we went from everything from total coliforms to fecal coliforms to Escherichia coli to actually specific kinds of genera within uh, the uh, E. coli groups. And uh, what we've had to rely on is public health standards. And public health standards are designed for water coming out of a tap, which is a whole lot different maybe from the way water in a wildland environment would operate, or at least the risk association with it. With it. So, that being as it may, the public health standards of the day, and they are shifting some to be a little more precise instead of just total coliform there, uh, there these axial enteric uh, creatures that live in the gut of the animal. But, uh, so looking more at fecal coliforms and specifically at E. coli. But at any rate, uh, the numbers are zero, and that's what drinking water standards are. Now, it doesn't come out statistically that. It's less than one colony per 100 mils of sampled water. Well, less than one, most of us would say zero, but it's statistically less than one. You can have 10%, I think it is, that show up bacteria as long as your average is less than zero. Okay, so zero. That's down here. Do we reach zero? Never. In my experience, and I've sampled thousands of streams across the West, uh, we have never reached zero. There's something. There's a bird, there's a rodent, there's a coyote, there's a something that lives in that area. And so when I talk to especially my young students, when I teach classes at Oregon State, uh, and I say, you want to go out and go backpacking and be Daniel Boone and flop down on your belly and drink out of the stream, bad idea. You know, carry your, your little dialysis pump, the, the little diaphragm pump that filters the water, or use your halazone tablets. To, it tastes terrible, but it'll kill the stuff that's in it. Or boil it, but do something, because you really don't want this stuff. And especially you don't want the protozoa that go with it that are things like Girardia or Cryptosporidium. They're not bacteria, they're protozoan. And uh, they're the ones that are really going to nail you. So uh, those are things that, you know, use some common sense. Because, as this diagram shows, we don't get to zero. We get to zero on our drinking water tap because our public water services for each community uh, runs this water through a chlorine drip. And so we all have have some security in our water that we're drinking out of the tap. So at any rate, that's good information. What's their next level? They came up with 100 of these bacteria per 100 mils of water. And that was what they called swimmable, fishable. Uh, in other words, water that you could have intimate contact with, but still be reasonably safe. 100 bacteria. And so this, when I'm water skiing, we have a, my kids and I have a speedboat, and we pull water skiers. And uh, when you're water skiing, and if you water ski like I water ski, there's going to be some intimate contact. Uh, because uh, my kids used to say, Dad, you're getting an enema right there. You know, the way I'd be dragged across the water. Uh, but at any rate, you're, uh, uh, I fall down a lot, and I'm in that water, you know, well over my head and then back up. Is there a chance I will ingest that? Try not to. But certainly, a mouthful of water is not unusual. That's 100, fishable, swimmable. 200, 
became casual contact. That was the number they used, the public health services did. And the idea there is I could probably fish in that and I might get my hands in it as I captured and released uh, water, uh, fish. But I'm probably not going to ingest any of it, at least not accidentally. And so uh, that's where that number comes in. And then they had another number that was 1,000. And 1,000 bacteria per 100 mils was designed to be water that they could clean up. With a chlorine drip, public health services could clean up this water. Okay, so they had some standards and they had some uh, criteria on, on risk, if you will, that are associated with this. Where do we fit here? And what has been our experience over the years? Well, that's zero and 100 was up here. So in the uh, Darling and Colthorpe example that I just showed you here, uh, they never met 100. In the experience I had in Oregon after I graduated from Utah State and went off to Corvallis to be Dr. Buckhouse, um, when that happened, I did a lot of sampling up around northeastern Oregon and the Wallowas and, and the Blue Mountains of Oregon, and uh, I found basically the same thing. I didn't find any streams that didn't have bacteria in them. I didn't find any streams in wildland management of livestock. Now we're not talking feedlots here, but in wildlife management of livestock that bumped over 100. They did vary some. And uh, I was telling the story once to uh, some uh, water providers for the city of La Grande, and uh, the young man that was involved with that said, well, you know, we do have water that's less, that meets drinking water standard. I said, I, well, that's certainly not my experience. May I see your data? And he showed it to me, and he gave me 100 samples that they had, and of those 100 samples, they had one that came out zero. So if we want to take that one sample, yes. But if you want to do the statistical kind of a thing where we take a number of samples and we average them, uh, they were um, they were something above less than one. So good quality stuff, I'm not suggesting that, but the concept of reaching zero in a wildlife situation, a wild land situation is, is not likely. And so there you have it. Well, that's interesting. Again, we have some managerial kinds of things. We have some knowledge to work with. We have some sense of what we're dealing with. We also have some sense of what we might be able to do. And maybe the take home message here is that there is risk, agreed. And there are probably some managerial ways that I can keep my risk at some kind of a tolerable level. So there we have it. Well, it moved on from there to uh, some research that now we're seeing, we're starting to get in the 80s and 90s and beyond. And the question is, well, how long do these bacteria persist? And where do they go? And what did they do? And so, um, uh, again, myself and others around the West were beginning to look at these things and saying, well, what do they do? And where do they go? One of the great experiments that I did, the, I guess, to provide entertainment to the cooperating landowner that worked with me uh, was to salt the stream with some known amount of cow pie and um, see what happened. And we had permission from everybody that, to do this. And this is where graduate students come in so handy because I didn't have to do it while I was there. But I got to be the supervisor, you know, and stay clean, whereas they had to go around with a garbage pail and collect fresh cow poops, put them in this garbage pail until we got the appropriate volume, and carry it over to the stream, dump it into the water, where we had a series of researchers downstream picking up water samples on a every 30 second basis so that we could get a sense of where the plume of water, where the plume of bacteria went. And what we discovered was we created a plume downstream, as you would expect, it went about 100 meters. 
And uh, then it kind of petered out. What was happening is the bacteria were settling to the sediments at the bottom of the stream. Now, recognize the stream had laminar flows, very well-behaved water flowing with each packet of water in nice laminar flow compared to the next. And within this relatively short distance, about 90% of these bacteria had precipitated out and were now involved with the sediments. So then uh, we put a pair of waders on each one of these grad students and uh, gave them an iron rake, you know, a rake, a garden rake, and put them out in the stream and said, stir up the bottom. And they did. And we got another plume. It resuspended and went downstream, same kind of deal. Okay, what did we learn from that? We learned they precipitated out fairly quickly, but they could be resuspended too. And so depending upon how one was managing their land, a vehicle crossing or a livestock crossing or something that might stir up the bottom would resuspend this plume. So something about roads and trails and things like this became important. And we learned something. Uh, and so that's good knowledge. Well, OK, how long do they last? And so again, over a period of time, we, uh, we collected the, the sediments now and analyzed them. And what we discovered was they tended to last something around a month. 30 to 40 days, and 90% of them had died in that period of time. Now we know that technically or theoretically, uh, they can reproduce in the uh, in the cold water stream, but that's under rather unique conditions, like at the margin of the stream where there's some warmth right there, as opposed to in the deeper column, and uh, under certain nutrient conditions, perhaps. Uh, what we were discovering is that it generally they die fairly quickly. Okay, what did we learn out of that deal? Hmm, timing means something. And if I got concerns about recreation or other things, the timing of livestock in the watershed could probably be pretty critical to me. And if I got a 4th of July weekend coming up, maybe that's not the time to have my animals in there. You know, if it's within 30 days of that sort of thing, but maybe before or after at some other time. Uh, Maybe I got a different different thing. So again, I'm trying to suggest to you that we've learned some things, we've got some knowledge, but we also have some basis to make some risk assessment and some managerial adjustment. Okay, pretty interesting stuff. I think it, it was quite fascinating. Well, that was interesting to all of us. And another question then came up. Well, how far away does this, oh, one last piece on this salted bacteria in the stream is uh, the laminar flow didn't stir this stuff up, but turbulent flow did. And we know that because we had a reservoir right up above us that had a penstock on it, and we had permission, even though it was a drought year, God bless this uh, rancher that controlled this stuff, he said, we want to know this information. I will sacrifice some water in the reservoir so that you can create a turbulent flow in the and stream below. So we went up, turned on the pen stop, opened the gate, put enough water down that we got turbulent flow, and lo and behold, turbulent flow would resuspend the stuff. So I don't have to have a graduate student with a rake or a trail with animal crossing or a vehicle crossing. Turbulent flow will do it. Now you remember your hydrology from physics. Uh, turbulent flow is the messy kind of flow of the water where it, it uh, has you know, white water kind of stuff, uh, stirring chaotic movement of the water downstream. That prompted us, you know, recognize we're in central Oregon here, that prompted us to go to the meteorological data and look at a long pattern of stream flow and precipitation record to determine how often would we likely get turbulent flow in that stream. And on Bear Creek in central Oregon, it turned out to be five days a year maximum, more likely four. So that was interesting again. And again, good management information if I want to draw a plan up, because I now also have an idea when that's coming. And in our country, it comes with snow melt. When the, the snow melts and we get a, a spring freshet coming down through there. And so, interesting. 
See, I'm starting to have tools. I'm starting to have tools in my toolbox. And if I heard the group as we went around here this morning, tools in your toolbox seem like a pretty good idea. And so we're, we're learning a few of these things. But the question came up, well, yeah, but how far away does this CalPy have to be, or well, buffer script kind of an idea, uh, to keep the bacteria from the stream, from getting in the stream in the first place? Our casual observations indicated it was about a meter, about three feet. So we did a little work on that and do, took a little, you know, there's no data like no data. So we took some samples to determine this. And what we discovered is three feet is about right for how far the thing will move unless you can suspend it in some water. So a raindrop splash erosion can bring it about three feet. A raindrop hitting something and splashing things out. Uh, if you want to move it further, further than three feet, there has to be some kind of, of flow of water down through there so this bacteria can get involved with that and carried down. And so that began to become a land management, livestock grazing, stubble height, infiltration kind of a question. How long does it take for the water to infiltrate into the ground so I don't get it in a, in a little rivulet that would carry it to the stream? And uh, what we discovered is that's the standard professorial answer of it depends. And it depends on a whole lot of things, on soil type, on soil uh, texture and structure, and especially vegetation. Any of you that took classes from me 100 years ago when you were at OSU uh, learned that I'm really keen on vegetation as a management tool because I can manage vegetation. A lot of these other things are kind of out of my purview. But you can manage vegetation. The way I manage vegetation is through the livestock. Because I can tell them when to be there and when they can't be there with some degree of assurance, which I can't do with many of the other f factors that are in the environment. So now we looked at something that I like to call the essence of watershed management. And write this one down. There's going to be a quiz afterwards, and this is the quiz. The essence of watershed management is the soil's ability to capture, store, and safely re release precipitation. Capture, store, safe release. You've probably all heard that phrase. It's been around for a number of decades, and it works. Now, you can imagine a guy like me doesn't particularly like bumper stickers because I can't imagine why anybody would want to have their whole philosophy in a short phrase attached to the bumper of their automobile. And yet I just gave you a bumper sticker. Capture, store, safe release. I rationalize that by saying this is not reductionist thinking. This is expansionist thinking. If you can remember capture, store, and safe release, then you can remember all the physical attributes that go into capture, which is infiltration. Remember, infiltration is water passing from the air interface into the soil profile. That's infiltration. Movement down through the soil profile is percolation, a different thing. And so if I'm encouraging infiltration, there's a number of things, if you look at any good hydrology or soil science textbook, they'll tell you there's a bunch of things that influence infiltration. There's soil texture and soil structure and temperatures and organisms and colloids and a whole bunch of things, most of which I can't do very much about. But every one of these things is in turn influenced by vegetation. I can influence soil structure, I can influence soil texture, I can influence colloidal uh, arrangements through vegetation. Hey, I got a tool. I can manage for infiltration. I can manage for capture. And so what I would answer that question then is how far of a buffer strip do you need or what does it take to get the water in the ground? It's a wide variety of things with all these soil and other conditions that I've just mentioned, but it is driven, or the thing I can manipulate is vegetation. 
So vegetation management is huge. And surprisingly enough, if you have the appropriate vegetation management, the distances are rather short. You know, we're not talking 400 feet. We're talking maybe, well, I don't want to use the number, from me to you, you know, shorter distances. And again, dependent on a whole number of factors, but uh, much shorter distances. So that's, that's really interesting. Capture, store, safe release. Well, let's touch for just a minute on store. If I can store the water in the soil profile, then it's there for a number of really good reasons that fill this whole umbrella, one of which is water quality, but other functional functionalities within the watershed are clearly there too. Uh, the one that's obvious is if I don't have water in the soil profile, I don't have water for the plant to grow for transpiration and metabolic reasons within that plant. True, and that one we'd all agree to, I think. But there's another more subtle one that really became interesting to us as we got into it a little bit, and that had something to do with mycorrhizae. Mycorrhizae are actually the creatures that do the work of water absorption and nutrient uh, uh, transfers. And uh, what they are are fungus and bacteria that grow in conjunction with the root hair. Kind of like a cow has rumen bacteria, the plant has mycorrhizae on its, uh, on its root hairs. And they don't grow out in a long linear fashion. They grow kind of like a clump. You know, it's like my fingers are the root hair and all of a sudden they're very, very furry. But they will change the absorption surfaces anywhere from 10 to 100 times big, big differences. And so the mycorrhizae become very, very critical. And interestingly enough, mycorrhizae are temperature driven. If I have soil temperatures that get very high, what I discover is that the mycorrhizae fail to thrive. So keeping the soil temperature, you know, down an inch below the soil surface, uh, at some kind of a moderated level encourages my mycorrhizae, which encourages this whole system of water absorption, nutrients reabsorption, plant growth, and my plants, remember, are my key to infiltration. And so I get a positive scenario going. Whereas if I nuke this thing, I go the other way. I not only have taken away whatever value those plants have in getting organics in the soil, breaking up the um, uh, patterns of flow and all of this sort of thing, but I also destroyed their ability to thrive because I destroyed the mycorrhizae's ability to thrive and we get a negative spiral. Well, I'd much rather work with the positive one. Okay, so there's capture and storage. And now safe release becomes cool. Safe release is the, the water coming out of the soil profile and on down the street, which it will do once we get this soil profile at some level of, of uh, saturation. So, what are the good things there? Well, the first one's erosion control. If I can put my water in the ground and I can move my water one soil pour at a time through the soil profile, I take away its kinetic energy. Can anybody remember physics? Can anybody remember high school? <laughs> Well, I barely can, and I remember the formula for work in physics, in our high school physics class. And work was defined as mass over distance. Mass times distance. Does that sound familiar? Yeah, kind of. Okay, well, that's really a definition for erosion, isn't it? I move a soil particle some distance. I created some kind of work, and that's what erosion is. It's not erosion if I can't move the soil particle. And it's not erosion if I don't displace the soil particle. So, it's all driven by kinetic energy. Water flowing over the surface of the land has a kinetic energy that's capable of moving my O horizon, it's capable of moving my A horizon, it's capable of moving my B horizon, and it's capable of moving clear down to my unconsolidated C horizon. And we've all seen it. 
We've seen various kinds of surface erosions which coalesce into various kinds of rill erosions which uh, coalesce into deep gullies, the depth of this room, and you know some really sorry kind of situations. So if I can put the water into the ground, I'm a hero. I have stopped erosion for all practical purposes. And that gets me a gold star. <laughs> hey, a big gold star, right, Julie? But there's more. And it, uh, this hero status just gets better and better and better. Yeah. So the next thing is, well, OK, what about various kinds of chemicals? And we worry a lot about various kinds of chemicals, especially if there's agricultural fields involved. And we talk about nitrates and phosphates as the two main ones in agriculture or wildlands. If we were dealing with an industrial complex, we'd start dealing with heavy, heavy metals and things like this. You trot over to the Hanford Reach over in uh, uh, South Central Oregon or Washington, and maybe we even get some really scary stuff like uh, nuclear waste. But in most wild lands, most agricultural lands, it's phosphates and nitrates, PO4 and NO3. And those are our big bugaboos. And the reason they're big bugaboos is they're plant growth and development fertilizer elements, if you will, that cause plant growth and development. If I've got the nitrates and phosphates in the uplands functioning the way I'd like to see them function, they're a real plus for me. Because I'm growing plants, and remember, plants are my key. On the other hand, if I flush them into the soil profile, I'm going to get the same kind of fertilizer effect, but I'm going to grow algae. And when I grow algae, I get algae blooms. And when I get algae blooms, I get algae die-offs. And when I get algae die-offs, I have to have decomposition. And when I get decomposition, I turn the photosynthesis formula around. The way the decomposition formula works is I extract oxygen in order to decompose this material. Now, Warm waters carry less oxygen than cold waters anyway. So I'm in the summertime, and I got as warm a water as I'm going to get. And I now have an algae bloom and die off. And I have to do decomposition. When that happens, I get fish gills. And I get all kinds of environmental degradation. So if I can keep those nutrients in the uplands, cycling through the uplands, they're doing me good. If I put them in the water, they're going to do me harm. How do I do that? Capture, store, and safe release. Put the water into the ground where the raindrop falls, and I bring my nutrients with it. And I have my nitrates and my phosphates working for me rather than against me. How about the bacteria? Same drill. EPA has something that you're all familiar with, and that's your, your municipal water treatment plants. And they often use something they call a rapid sand filter. And what that is is a sprinkler system that causes the water to go down through a rapid sand filter. And it, it uh, extracts most of the bacteria. I've got a watershed full of rapid sand filters. If I can put the water into the ground where it falls, I've got my entire uplands, and on a given watershed throughout the West, about 2% is riparian zone, about 98% is upland. I've got 98% of my watershed that I can use as my water purification system. Get that water into the ground, take that bacteria with it, and have all of those biologically active sites in the soil profile having one microbe eat the next. And you all know that uh, water coming from deep wells generally, you know, it's had this filtration thing, generally have a much higher quality than surface waters do. So, hey, I'm getting hero status at every turn, aren't I? By capturing that <laughs> raindrop. I've just taken care of erosion. I've just taken care of nutrients. I've just taken care of bacteria. And in Oregon, and I'll bet you in Washington as well, Water temperatures were a huge issue for us. It was a huge issue several years ago. It's died down a little bit now, but it's still big. And that is the question of water temperatures for salmonid fishes. And there were standards that had been developed uh, 54 degrees for 
bull trout, 64 degrees for most salmonids. Uh, one exception being the Lahontan trout, which has evolved in those desert conditions out in southeast Oregon, places like the Wahis, and uh, they have a little higher tolerance than that. But we're dealing with pretty cool waters for these fish to thrive. And the reason they need the cool waters I've already alluded to. It's got to do with oxygen in the water. Cold water supports more oxygen, or will hold more oxygen than warmer waters do. The salmonid fishes are evolved in cold water. They have a gill structure that will extract water or oxygen if it's in ample supply. If you live down further in the watershed, in the stream column, uh, where the waters are warmer and more stagnant, less aerated, uh, then you better be a bass or a bluegill because they have the gill structure that can extract oxygen from these poor supplies of oxygen. But the salmonids will die. They don't cook in these warm temperatures. They suffocate. So I need cold water with high levels of oxygen. Well, it comes back to my capture, store, and safe release formula. If I can get the water into the ground and I can put it down 30 centimeters, two and a half feet, um, what I find is I have a near constant 50 degree temperature year round. <clears throat> the example I like to use is, is somebody going into a cave. If you're a spelunker and go into a cave on an August day, the cave feels wonderfully cool, doesn't it? Gosh, it feels like it's about 50 degrees. And if I go in that same cave on a cold zero degree day in January, this cave feels really warm, like maybe 50 degrees compared to zero outside. And I'll tell you, if I were an Aboriginal person living back in the day, I think that cave would be a pretty important place for me, you know, to create some kind of safe haven. Uh, well, interestingly enough, your experience there is exactly what this water quality issue can be on temperature. If I can put the water in contact with that 50 degree relatively constant subsurface temperature, and it does vary a little, it varies about five degrees over a course of a year, and there's a lag time on it. So my hottest temperatures are usually in September, and my coldest temperatures are usually in about March or April. Uh, on the 45th parallel, which is roughly where we are. Okay, so you've got this 50 degree temperature. If I put the water in contact with it, move it subsurface out to a spring or a seep, I've delivered 50 degree water to your fish. Now that fits my standards very nicely, doesn't it? And again, it's a wonderful thing. So, managerial kinds of pieces for us. We suddenly got some tools, don't we? We have a philosophy. Our philosophy is we want the water in the ground because it does all these good things for us. That's our philosophy. And then our tool, how we get there, well, we've learned a few things with this kind of stuff, and Ken is going to give you lots more of it. He's got this kind of stuff in spades. And uh, so when you hear that, you'll see some you know, some additional numbers and some additional experience, and it kind of follows the same track. And what you can say now is, okay, I can't understand where the dangers are. I can't understand who's hiding behind what tree with a rifle. And I can't understand how I can respond to it. Okay, so that's all good. Um, I like to view this as an iron fist and a velvet glove. And the iron fist is not regulation. The iron fist is knowledge. Knowledge is your powerful tool. But you know, if I take knowledge and I shove it down your throat, it's not exactly palatable. And so the question that came up several times around the room was, how do I get people to the table? How do I get people to sit down and listen to stuff so that I can understand what is proper management that will bring me these positive benefits and what is uh, abusive kind of management that will spin the other direction, because they can go either way. It's all about how you manage it. Then we can talk about something, we can devise strategies. Maybe it's going to be a fencing program. Maybe it's not. <coughs> but we have an opportunity to devise strategies. Well, how do you get the people there? That's the velvet glove. 
that you go with. And what I've discovered is several things that I've worked with folks. And you know what the biggest one is? It's food. <laughs> food! We always have food. Tip brought donuts. If we eat our donuts and drink our coffee, there's something about our culture. We do not sit down to eat with our enemy. And if I share a meal with whoever it is that has a different point of view than me, we have perhaps agreed that we have different points of view, but we have also suggested that we're not enemies, because we, we don't break bread with enemies. Food really works. And, you know, sometimes it's donuts. More often than not, a barbecue or something where there's a certain amount of intermingling. Now, beer helps. But, um, um, so you get this, this thing going. What we're doing is developing relationships. Uh, the other thing that I've found really helps is if um, whoever the antagonists are, um, learn that there's a face behind the name. So these DOE guys, for example, if they just send out letters or pamphlets or something, they're, they're not humans. They are some entity some other place. But if they get out and mingle, then they're humans. I know Ben a little bit, and I'm comfortable with him because I have a sense of him. You know? And consequently, it works. So again, getting out and about. We have found that these kinds of, of uh, gatherings, like we're having right now, are helpful. But what we found is even more helpful is if we could do the same thing on the ground. And the reason it's better on the ground is because Julie has an idea about a blue ribbon trout stream in Montana. And even though I was born in Montana, I was raised in Nevada, and down in Modoc County in California, and I have a little different perception. And so I'm thinking about my Nevada stream, she's thinking about her Montana stream, and we have a big war. Wouldn't it be better? Julie's there and I'm here. And Keevan, who's the most marvelous man I've ever met in terms of bringing people together, uh, says, okay, that spot right there. What do you see? Now, we're not in Montana, we're not in Nevada. We're right there. And now we start dealing with reality. And it really works. Is this raw spot on the bank a problem or not? And I'm not thinking about some awful landslide that occurred someplace or something that is a, perhaps a summer precipitation zone and heals within minutes once I get the rains going. It's an issue here and now. And so that's why I really like being on the ground. And feed them, of course. Uh, so now we start developing relationships and we start dealing with the here and now of this particular spot. Now, if we need to go to Montana, I'm all for it. And I'd be happy to show you Nevada. But today we're dealing with here and now, right here. So the field work really helps. And it's sometimes hard because we have budgets and we have time constraints and we have bosses that don't want us out in the field because they kind of see that as too time consuming and you could do the same thing on the computer. Well, maybe not. You know, I think all of you that have been around for more than about a day and a half know that the field aspect of it has a real positive piece to it. So I really encourage that. I really encourage, uh, and I encourage it to be more than just you and I as, as choir, but bring in some of the outsiders as well. Um, I have found most groups I can work with. I have found a few groups I can't. And of the groups that I find that I can work with, there are always groups that are trying to understand who's the best of them all. It's the League of Women's Voters. Not that they know anything about natural resources, but they're bright and they're interested and they want knowledge. They're not running on stereotypes. They're not running on paradigms. They want real factual information. They're ideal to work with. Kiwanis clubs and city clubs, um, these kinds of things that you get an opportunity to talk to on occasion, do a good job too. Generally, they're pretty easy. Environmental groups are mixed bag. 
most of them want the right thing. And most of them, I find Sierra Club, Audubon Society, uh, some of those kinds of people, High Desert Association, many of those have been easy to work with because, again, they're looking for a goal, they're trying to reach a goal. The place where I've run into trouble are with people that want a conflict. And the reason they want a conflict is because that's their finances. I can't save the whales unless I have some money coming in and pay my staff, you know, all that sort of stuff. And so developing a conflict, real or imaginary, is important to them. And they're difficult to work with because it's the conflict that's important, it seems. And I've dealt with several of them. And when we finally had enough trust that we could sit down and have a beer together, they would usually tell me, we think we can make a bigger impact by bringing in a lawsuit. And then they would tell me on the side, and besides, if we did what you're suggesting, we'd be out of business because we'd make enough progress that they wouldn't need us anymore. So um, that's cynical, isn't it? But that's a small percentage of the people that I work with, and some of them are pretty much impossible. Most of them, probably 99% of them, want to learn, have their hearts in the right place, and are going in the right direction. But you have to get together with them. You have to develop some trust. You have to deal with the here and now so that we're looking at the same thing and not bringing in paradigms that are wildly different. So that's my response to almost everything that I heard around here. How do we learn something? Well, hopefully some of this background helped, that you kind of see how this thing evolved over time, for better or for worse, and certainly fits and starts. But uh, a little bit about how it came. Something, I like to use this one because it's really good about showing some of the possibilities that might happen, some managerial things that I could do to either make it better or make it worse. And then that philosophy, and I'm really keen on the philosophy. I've made a whole career on this capture store safe release thing. Um, you know, it works whether I'm talking to a grade school class or I'm talking to hydrologists that are certified. You know, it, and certifiable maybe with hydrologists. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, it, uh, it's a powerful tool because it's a conceptual philosophy that most people can get their head around. Now, how do we get the capture? That, there's a whole lot of things going into that, and that's just managerial stuff. And it's not the same everywhere. So it becomes site-specific, it becomes managerial, it becomes a question of, of uh, climate and soils and, and class of livestock and timing of use and, you know, all these things that, that uh, you all have some familiarity with. So that's my story. And like President Clinton's mother, who, remember, had slipped away to go to Las Vegas and the reporters found her down there and interviewed her, she explained that she was down there on a car buying trip or something. Not, she wasn't a gambler. And that's her story, and she's sticking with it. This is my story, and I'm sticking with it. Um, I think there's some value here to have it at least as background, to get a sense of where we come from, a sense of where we're going, and hopefully a little bit of encouragement <coughs> on how do we get some of the warring parties together? How do we get some balance here? Well, these become social issues to a large extent. And as we all know, we went into business because we wanted to be hermits and sit on a hillside. But we have to break that paradigm and understand that we have to deal with people. And uh, something like the coordinated resource management planning that Jim and Keevan have been doing, uh, ideal. And both of them would tell you it's got as much to do with the sociology of the thing as it does with the biology of it. And so, you know, it's a, it's a true story. And I think uh, it's well worth sticking with. <laughs>